It's great to have you with us this morning. I think you've got sheets uh, to be able to uh, go through. So if you could have them now and we will uh, be able to get into the message. Everybody got their sheets. Uh, that's, that's good. Uh, we will uh, be looking particularly at verse five, verse five. And uh, we want to be thinking about the Lord Jesus as the glory of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ as the glory of the Lord. Verse five in our passage, we read, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So let's stop. Let's stop and think. Let's stop and think about what we've read in verse five. Let's be thinking about what it means, the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. It shall be visible. It shall be seen. This glory of the Lord, what's the glory of the Lord? It is splendor it is awesome it is showing one who is worthy of all praise it's the glory of the lord and this one who is all glorious he is a consuming fire hebrews Chapter 12, verse 29. This God is the one who says in Exodus 33 and verse 20, he says to Moses, you cannot see my face for man shall not see my face and, and live. And the glory of the Lord is appearing. And he's a repairing to all people together. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So children, everybody, what would happen if you got a hundred miles away from the sun? What would happen to us if we were a hundred miles away from the sun? Imagine we would just drop down 100 miles away from the sun. What would happen to us? We would just be gone like that. We would evaporate instantaneously with the magnificence of the sun. Well, how will we survive before this God? It's the glory of the Lord has been revealed. It, it's to all men, it's to all flesh, it says there, together. Is it just going to be a universal extermination? It's the mouth of the Lord that's spoken. What does it say, mouth? It's the genuineness of the word, isn't it? From the mouth of the Lord. So are we all confused? What is going on here? Well, let's journey through our passage because we really should start alarmed as we venture into this message this morning. But as we see the glory of the Lord as the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the glory of the Lord. Then I trust we could start to unveil some of these things. So five words from the passage this morning. Five words. First word is in verse one. What do you think the word is? In verse one, children, what do you think the word is in verse one? Just have a look at verse one. We've got the Bible. The word we're going to choose is number one, comfort. Comfort. Good to have a comfort among us this morning. But comfort is the word to start with. Isaiah 40 verse one says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Let's go back to chapter 39 and get some idea of what's going on here. Essentially, the book of Isaiah is divided into two. 
It's divided into chapters one to 39 and chapters 40 through to 66. So we are right at the beginning of the second section. And if you read chapters one to 39, it really in summary it is something along the lines, the people who choose to go their own way and not go God's way will end up under the judgment of God and all will go badly. And so we come to the end of uh, chapter 39 and this statement is made in Hezekiah's day. So we're around about, let's try and get these dates. It's not easy to get in our minds, but we're around about 700 years before the Lord Jesus came. And King Hezekiah, he's on the throne. And this statement is made in verse 6. Behold, the days are coming, chapter 39 and verse 6. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Okay, so around about 700 BC, this is speaking about something that happened about, yeah, it took place finally took place in 586 BC. So that's how many years? Oh, 120 years later, 110, 120 years later, what was taken, spoken of here took place. And when we come into Isaiah 40, Isaiah is speaking now about what has happened or what is happening to the people who are now in Babylon. So he's speaking about something which is, well, somewhat, 130 years ahead when they're actually down in Babylon and living there. Okay, so your people who should have been in Jerusalem and, and in the land of Judah have now been carted off to, to Babylon. And are they happy to be there? Well, it's not home. It's not where they wanted to be. They're in disarray. They've been taken over by an enemy, and it really is not. It's not going well. They had promises of being a, a, of great things, and now it's all fallen apart. Perhaps that's you this morning. Perhaps you thought that life was going to work out in a certain way, with a certain relationship, with a certain financial backing with a certain uh, what might it be might even have been coming to the uk you thought it's all going to work out well and it's not working out well and you feel in disarray you don't know what's going to happen just notice something else here as well in the final verse of chapter 39 hezekiah says this is hezekiah around 700 bc he says to isaiah the word of the lord that you have spoken is good for he thought there'll be peace and security in my days Basically, Hezekiah says, that's all, that's all down the road. It's all okay for me now. There may be problems ahead for some other people, but I, it's okay. Those, those people then can take care of themselves. We're going to do fine in our time. People not interested. Hezekiah wasn't interested in the problems that those people are going to have in the future. Or perhaps you're feeling this morning that people are not interested in you. Nobody's bothered about you. And then this word comes. And the first word is, come, come. Twice, emphasis, importance, comfort, comfort. And the idea is be strengthened, be stabilized, be encouraged. Everything may be falling apart. The things you anticipate, the things you hoped for, or the things that you wanted may be all a mess. And people may not be interested in your situation, but God says, comfort, comfort my people. Hear this. Be strengthened. I have a message for you. It's if the Lord says, I want to say this to you. First of all, you struggling people down in Babylon, just be encouraged from me. It's my message, he says. It says, says the law. This is a message. A message from God. A message to his people. A message to us. A message to you. Comfort, comfort, be strengthened. Have this.
from me. And it's just, the idea of says your God is continually keep saying it, keep saying it. The thing we think about is all, all well and good, isn't it? You've all, perhaps you've all been in this situation where, where, where somebody just utters meaningless words. You know, you're in a difficult situation and somebody just says to you, oh, it'll all work out well in the end. And you say, well, it's not working out very well at the moment. So that's pretty hopeless for me to hear from you. And it all sounds very empty, doesn't it? And so are these just empty words? You know, verse five is going to tell us about a God who is majestic. And what are we going to do? And somebody's just talking about comfort, comfort. That's not very much help to me at the moment because there's a God who I've thought, who we're aware of in verse five, is glorious, who is majestic, who is splendor. And awesome. So let's move on. Second word this morning. If the first word everybody was comfort. The second word this morning is tenderly, tenderly speak tenderly to Jerusalem. There's an interesting thing immediately with regard to Jerusalem. They say, we're not in Jerusalem, but God says, you are still Jerusalem to me. You are still special to me. You are still important to me. Dear Christian, in your struggles this morning that I don't know, hear from God, you are important to him. You are special to him. And here is this message. Speak tenderly and cry to her. Now, tenderly. What does it mean to speak tenderly? Tenderly. There's a man called Ian MacDonald. Now, you have to be a bit old like me to remember Ian MacDonald. Some of you may well remember. Falklands War, April, May 1982. Ian MacDonald was the man from the Ministry of Defence who came on to give the messages about the Falklands War. And you know one thing about Ian MacDonald? He had absolutely zero emotion. There wasn't a scrap of emotion. If you go and search of it on YouTube, you will see. The man had no emotion. He just passed on words about facts. No emotion. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about tenderness. We're talk the idea is you, you speak heart to heart. You, you think about the people down in Babylon. That, that, they're a broken people. They're a, they're a messed up people. They don't want some cold words. They want some tender words. They want some heart to heart. We, 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 we have that in our language, don't we? Speak heart to heart. That's what's going on here. Speak heart to heart. Uh, immediately, we must think that you have to have it in your own heart before you can speak to somebody else's heart. <laughs> you have to be aware of God working in your own heart before you can speak with tender words to somebody else. Think about the tender words these heart-to-heart -heart words, when we are telling the people we meet about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we should, yes, we can be firm at times, yes, we can be direct, but always with tenderness to a people who are in need, for a people who are in desperate spiritual need, a tenderness, a heart-to-heart. Parents, do you speak with tenderness to your children or are you just passing on some words which are distant to you from the Bible? Do your children know that your heart is for them? And this applies generally, doesn't it, with our words? We have a tenderness about our words in all of our ways and generally the way we speak. Yes, parents, but other situations. We should be known for a tenderness, a heart-to-heartness about us, but also specifically when we're bringing the message of the Bible. Parents, be thinking about it. Speaking to our neighbours, with our work colleagues, are we known as people who have a heart-to-heartness about us? But then there is also, as we're thinking about the way we speak, but we speak tenderly, but we speak clearly. It's not a mumbled message. If you go down into verse two, cry to her and make it clear. Jerusalem doesn't know what to hear. What did you say? What was that about? 
No mumbling. Speak clearly, tenderly and clearly. These things need to be heard. And what is the message? What is the message to be tenderly passed on? It is your hardship, your warfare, your struggle is at an end. Your time of going through an ordeal is at an end. Is at an end. Tenderly, the message is related. It is passed on. And then we hear these beautiful words that her iniquity is pardoned, that all of the wrong things she has done are taken away. It's as if Isaiah says to those people, this is, I want to get there. We almost might say, well, I'd like a bit more background here. I'd like a bit more detail. What's going on? Why are you saying this? And it's as if Isaiah says, don't bother about that. that. You've just got to know this straight away. Your iniquities are the main thing about your problem. Your iniquities. It's not your circumstances. It's not your relationships. It's your iniquities, your rebellion against God. And he's saying there is a pardon. There is a taking away. And this is to be related tenderly. This beautiful message of a pardon for iniquity. And then that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Well, if you receive from my hand about your sins, I wouldn't be too keen on having that because you might not ever, might not know what you might get from my hand. But when you get it from the Lord's hand, from the Lord's hand, it is good. Let's think about what this means. Let's think about what this means. The idea about this, this double thing is something, something like this. It's something like this. We've got a sheet of paper. We've got a sheet of paper here. Sheet of paper. And we fold it in half. And we fold it in half. Okay? Like that. So you've got a, it, it's folded down the middle. So you've got a double pay, a double a double side, you might say. And it's as if something like this. On this side, on this side is all of our sins. On this side are all of the things that we have done, which are, are against God. They're all written in detail. Everyone. All there. And on this side, we have the work of God to deal with all that's on this side. So it's like you come that way and the salvation of God comes, the saving efforts of God come on this side and everything is dealt with. Every little bit, every dirt, every problem is dealt with and it is all forgiven, all removed. And what are we speaking about immediately? What are we showing? We are showing the fact that Jesus Christ has come and that in his saving work at the cross of Calvary, his glorious intervention, that he has done everything to take away all of those things written for his people. The exact, we might say, the exact replica has been paid. Every little sin. Every big sin dealt with and removed. So speak tenderly to Jerusalem about that. your struggles. You're over. Your difficulties are over because there is a salvation. There is this one to come who is, we might say, the Lord's hand paying the price. At Calvary's cross and the Lord's Supper is going to specially signify that to us this morning. And so we, we glory immediately in the fact that, oh, there's some comfort here. There really is some strengthening here. God has really done something. He has dealt with the problem at the heart of our issues. How does it all fit together? There's that glory of the Lord coming, and it's coming to all people. So let's think about, I'm going to think about a third word now. 
I'm going to think about voice. Verses three and four start to get these things fixed into place. We've got to start to get them fixed into place as regards to how this all happens. There is a voice crying, verse three. There is a voice. Interesting, it says voice, doesn't it? It doesn't say person. It doesn't give a name. Just simply a voice. I think that gives the emphasis that the important thing for people to take heed to is the message that is coming through that voice. I want everybody to think big of you about how you have spoken and so many people have been led to Christ and so many people have done this and done that and it was me who spoke and it was be happy to be a voice are you happy to be a voice simply to relay the message because that's the important thing dare I say without unnecessarily drawing attention to Abraham. Abraham has been a voice in one sense in Feltham Town Centre many times already this year, simply passing on a leaflet. Nothing dramatic, but he's passed on a leaflet. A voice. For me, back in May 1986, as I was troubled in my heart and in my soul, I happened to be one Sunday afternoon in Richmond Park and this lady came and she just came she was with a group she just came out and she came to me and she gave me it's a little bit tattered and torn now she gave me that booklet she was a voice simply passing something on I don't know who she is I don't know and she won't know anything about what happened to me subsequently just a voice, not wanting honour for her name, but just wanting to pass on something to honour her saviour. Be happy to be a voice. Don't just say, well, if the job is, you know, if the job is of a certain size, you know, with a certain amount of prestige, then I'll do it because people will notice me and I'll be, I'll be reckoned to be somebody of significance. Don't think like that, brothers and sisters. Just be happy to be a voice to pass on the message. Nobody else may ever know what you have done. Be happy to be a voice. And now the voice comes, so that's my third word. And then the voice comes, comes and speaks of in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Specifically, my fourth word is wilderness. Wilderness. One of the big problems so many people have about coming to faith is, is simply this, isn't it? Maybe your problem. They think, I've got to be of a certain standard for God to save me, you know? I've got to do my bit so as I get into a position where I am sufficiently good for God to do some good for me. And it's wrong. You see, God comes into the wilderness. He comes into the desert. Oh, 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 a wilderness. What's a wilderness? A wilderness where there's just scrub, nothing much there. There's no real fruit. There's no real value in the plants. It's just a wilderness. It's a wilderness. A desert, dry and arid. And this is where God comes. Dare I say, he comes to places like Felton. <laughs> Perhaps not much to recommend Felton. <laughs> but God comes to wildernesses like Felton. And he starts to do his work through little, well, little me. <laughs> and perhaps not so little you. <laughs> But he can come and he can start to do away and he can start to speak about preparing the way of the Lord. And he can start to speak about. About making a making straight a highway 
for our God. Here in your family, perhaps parents this morning, you feel something like I feel about parenting and you feel things are in disarray. And you think, wow, I don't think God can do something with this lot here. But God can come into your situation. In fact, this is where he especially likes to come into the wildernesses and into the deserts and start to work. And of course, we are thinking here of one who came into the wilderness of 400 years with no revelation from God. Nothing. God had not spoken for over 400 years. No voice from heaven. And then John the Baptist comes. John the Baptist comes. He is the one who comes to make declaration concerning the Lord Jesus Christ coming. But in a sense, I hasten on. For God delights to work in wildernesses. God delights to work in the wildernesses of our hearts. Number five, then, we thought about the comfort and we thought about the tenderness and we thought about the wilderness and we're thinking about the people down in Babylon and we're thinking of the people in Feltham and we're thinking about the people in Feltham Evangelical Church this morning. We're going to think about a highway. We're going to think about a highway. There in verse three, make straight the desert. It makes straight in the desert. A highway for our God. Verse 4. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill will be made low. And the uneven ground shall become level. And the rough places a plain. What's going on here? What's going on? You got a posh visitor coming. You got an important visitor. Queen Elizabeth is coming to Feltham. Not, I'm not aware that she ever has been to Feltham in the however nearly 70 years that she's been on the throne. I'm not sure she's ever been, but imagine she's coming and what will they do? They'll get everything smartened up and they'll get all the roads prepared and she'll be able to come in in a degree of glory and everything will look posh. Well, that's the idea here. It's, the, it's, it's, it's making a motorway. It's making a motorway. And as you look at verse four, you can almost get the feel. What are there? There's bulldozers. Uh, there's diggers. There's cranes. There's all kinds. There's explosives. All these things are going on to make the highway, make the entrance. And this is the man, John the Baptist, coming. This is he who came. And so we read of the fulfillment in Luke and at chapter, chapter three, uh, no, chapter four, I believe it is, chapter four. And he went into all the region around the Jordan. This is John the Baptist proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. As it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, hear what it says, Luke chapter four. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways. John the Baptist has come with his bulldozer and his cranes. And his explosives and his diggers. And he's clearing away what? He's clearing away sin. He's exploding into the scene and saying, Israel, like the message came to Babylon the years previously, now we're around about, around about 30 years. To the Lord Jesus was born and the, John the Baptist is introducing the Lord Jesus and he's, he has this ministry and he's calling the people to repentance. John the Baptist is your 
repentance and he's breaking up the ground to get the highway ready the highway ready for the important visitor the highway ready for the one who really matters and he's doing all the necessary work he's preaching repentance now this is so important for us we need to be broken up we need to be smashed up individually I say that carefully, but I say that appropriately because we need to be aware of our sin. We need to be convicted of our sin. We need to be aware of how grievous it is before God. We need to be aware that the judgment of God is against us and the terrors of hell are before us on account of our sin. And we need to be broken. We need to be convicted. We need to be alarmed. We need to have the, the bulldozers and the cranes and the diggers and the explosives breaking up our own hearts so that we are aware that we need one to arrive on a highway which is not from within ourselves but is coming in from outside and so the highway is being made so we've had comfort God wants us to be comforted today. In the taking of the Lord's Supper, God wants us to be comforted. But he has a meaningful message concerning that comfort because we're to speak tenderly, tenderly about a salvation for the forgiveness of sins. And voices are to be raised to speak about the purposes of God in a wilderness, in a wilderness which doesn't look very optimistic. God comes and there's a highway. There's a highway being made. And... Verse 5 starts to have a little bit of a different feel, doesn't it? And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. A highway has been made. And what does John 1 verse 14 say concerning the Lord Jesus Christ? And we beheld his glory. The word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. What has happened? The glory of God has arrived on the highway. The glory of God has entered into this world. And the glory of God is a person. The glory of God is Jesus Christ. The one who went about doing good and healing those who are oppressed of the devil. The one who pleased the Lord in all of his ways. The one who, in his character and in his life, showed us all of the glory of God. A hatred of wrong, a lover of people, a desirer of people to come into the way of righteousness. If Jesus Christ does not come, God is always invisible. If Jesus Christ does not come, God is always invisible. But now God is invisible and we've seen his glory on the pages of scripture. We've seen his glory. We've seen what God is like. We've seen the magnificence of God in the beauty of Jesus Christ, the glorious kindness of Jesus Christ. And we look on and say, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate majesty. Period. And he's come to achieve verse two. He's come to be the all glorious one who would take at the cross. Vile shame. Suffering and pain. Misery and death. Because he took our sin. He was marred more than anyone, as Isaiah 53 would tell us, and that is what is ahead here. He was marred, twisted more than anyone. But his glory stood. 
He consumed the shame and the misery and the death in his death. And in the glory of his resurrection, he says, what does he say? Verse two, he says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to them and speak of iniquity, which has been pardoned and speak of a double payment, an equivalent payment for your sins. The glory of God has appeared. It has appeared in a person and all is different now. And it's for all flesh together. Too young? No. Too old? No. Too bad? No. Too good? No. Too anything? No. You come as one who's felt the bulldozers and the cranes and the explosives. God has worked in your heart and you just see highway Lord Jesus come on the highway into my heart and this is what we are doing now as we come to the Lord's Supper brothers and sisters we're wanting the highway of the love of God of the glory of God in Jesus Christ to come into our hearts for no longer do we fear when we think of the glory of the Lord and we cower rightly but now it's all transformed and we say Lord Jesus you have come your love is beyond all love and I want to speak tenderly to you. I dare say, brothers and sisters, if I've ever spoken harshly to you, and I feel I have perhaps at times, I want to just speak tenderly to you today and say, come, come and appreciate these things. Know that God is ministering into your heart, that the Lord Jesus is coming on that highway afresh. As you're going to take of the bread and take of the cup, be aware that this one is the one who has paid the price. The all-glorious one took your shame that you might have his glory. The glory of the God is no longer repulsive. It's attractive in Jesus Christ. Oh, what a gospel. Oh, what a savior. The glory of God has appeared to all flesh. To you. Even me, twisted and wrecked, messed up by sin. God is The mouth of the Lord has spoken. This morning, everybody, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And we're overwhelmed. The glory of God. The glory of the Lord is Jesus Christ. We're going to prepare ourselves in song now. Please stay seated and just be preparing yourself. You need to feel some bulldozers and cranes just against smashing those sins that have come into your life. Then feel them even in this song. <laughs>